Hello and welcome to week 7's lectures on Dickens's A Tale of Two Cities. In this set of chapters, we will uh, look once again at some of the romantic uh, trajectories which are unraveling as well as finishing off simultaneously in the context of Sidney Carton and Lucy Manette. And then we will also take a analytical look at uh, Jerry Cruncher and what he is up to as a resurrection man. So, these are the primarily the narrative incidents which will occupy our interest and we might want to think about the relationship between the uh, incidents and their symbolic and thematic meaning in the context of a tale of two cities. This chapter is entitled the fellow of no delicacy and this chapter is a companion piece to the previous chapter uh, in which we saw a uh, striver striving to marry Lucy Minette and failing uh, in that objective of his. So, this is again a companion chapter and uh, in this one we see uh, Sidney Carton being referred to as the fellow of no delicacy, but in fact he is uh, trying to be as uh, delicate as sophisticated as possible in his uh, approaches to Lucy Minette. Many a night he vaguely and unhappily wandered there when wine had brought no transitory gladness to him, many a dreary daybreak revealed his solitary figure lingering there and still lingering there when the first beams of the sun brought into strong relief, removed beauties of architecture in spires of churches and lofty buildings as perhaps the quiet time brought some sense of better things else forgotten and unattainable into his mind. This excerpt shows Sidney Carton wandering about in the environs of Lucy Minette's home. In fact, we can say that Sidney Carton is haunting the home of uh, Lucy and he comes to this particular uh, neighborhood because wine does not give him any kind of rest. Uh, we can also sense that uh, Sidney Carton is a restless figure. In fact, he literally does not sleep. He does not get any sleep uh, in this novel until the final uh, moment when he uh, gives up life and sleeps forever. So, um, that is the status of Sidney Carton in terms of this narrative. He is constantly haunting, he is constantly wandering unhappily and he is a solitary figure. We do not see him as part of a family. The only pseudo family that he has is uh, Lucy Minette uh, uh, and he visits that house uh, only rarely that is what the narrative tells us. So, this man haunts the empty streets and he stays overnight uh, in the streets and he even watches the sun rise and how the rays of the sun um, you know falls on the spires of churches and lofty buildings and, uh, and, and the atmosphere is very quiet and this quietness and this dark reality of all these architecture somehow tries to give him a clearer sense of better things and um, these things remind him of forgotten and unattainable aspirations and once again that makes him restless. So, he is a spirit that does not get any peace and he uh, somehow migrates to Soho Square where his beloved uh, is residing. And Carton decides to go up to Lucy and declare his affection. So, it is a very interesting uh, romantic moment in the novel because he has no expectations of being uh, accepted. He does not want to be successful in his courtship of Lucy Minette. So, this is what he tells her, do not be afraid to hear me, do not shrink from anything I say. I am like one who died young. All my 
my life might have been. So uh, this is what he has to say. It's a very interesting romantic proposal and he says don't, don't shrink away. Just hear me out. Just listen to my declaration. I'm like a ghost. That, that's the sense of this particular statement. I'm, I'm a ghost living this life. My life is something that should have been but it isn't. And Lucy Minette is very sympathetic uh, and she says, no, Mr. Carton, I am sure that the best part of it might still be, I'm sure that you might uh, be much, much worthier of yourself. So she uh, intervenes and tells him that perhaps um, the better part of his life is still to come and that he's capable of much better, higher things, worthier things. So she somehow tries to inspire him and this aspect of Lucy is what Carton uh, really admires and, and wants to be surrounded by that kind of optimism uh, that will lift him from his uh, uh, past and present which is deadening. If it had been possible, Miss Manette, that you could have returned the love of the man you see before you, self-flung away, wasted, drunken, poor creature of misuse as you know him to be, he would have been conscious this day and hour in spite of his happiness that he would bring you to misery, bring you to sorrow and repentance, blight you, disgrace you, pull you down with him. I know very well that you can have no tenderness for me. Uh, I ask for none. I am even thankful that it cannot be. This is a very interesting uh, romantic trajectory which is what I mentioned uh, when I began this lecture because uh, even though Ms. Cart Ms., uh, Mr. Carton is very much in love with Lucy Manette, he knows that he is not the right man to uh, marry Lucy uh, and uh, he tells her even if it is possible for you to return that uh, affection that I have for you, uh, you will regret that returning of um, affection for such a man as I am. So he says that you would throw yourself, um, uh, you will throw yourself, you will uh, lose your happiness, you will be miserable, you will be sorrowful, you will repent if you did fall in love with me and uh, married me. He says that I will blight you, I will affect you. Um, if I did marry you, I will bring disgrace into your life and I will destroy you uh, with me. So this is a match that cannot happen and it's good that it doesn't happen because it's not going to end very well. And he declares that I know that you don't have any tenderness for me and in fact I don't ask for any tenderness and I'm even grateful that you cannot be uh, affectionate towards me. So it's a very weird uh, romantic uh, uh, courtship that you see here. It's a, it's a kind of a one-sided declaration of love. It's a, it's a uh, dysfunctional romantic trajectory that we have marked out for Sidney Carton. So uh, even though he knows uh, the kind of purity that is invested in Lucy Manette, he doesn't want to come closer and stain it. And in fact, he is not manipulating uh, the affections, the regard uh, that Lucy has for Sidney Carton as a friend. Uh, but he doesn't want to once again uh, hide his uh, real affections for Lucy. Therefore, he declares it and then also assures shows her that he is not the uh, best man to be married to her. So uh, it's a very honest uh, declaration of love that he has for Lucy. And he says, I wish you to know that you have been the last dream of my soul. In my degradation, I have not been so degraded by the sight of you with your father and of this home made such a home by you has stirred old shadows that I thought had died out of me. Um, it's, it's uh, once again uh, a, a declaration that not only evokes the goodness of Lucy's soul, it also evokes the perfect domesticity that she has tried to um, construct uh, with her father at the center. So he says that um, 
it, the sight of you with your father he doesn't say it's just the sight of you that has uh, stirred uh, old shadows he doesn't say that i'm inspired by you to be a good man he says that i'm inspired by you with your father and of this home made such a home so it's the father daughter bond embedded in a in a kind of an ideal domesticity that's what uh, becomes attractive to sydney carton as it was attractive to darnay both the men are affected by lucy minette in terms of her regard for this patriarch uh, dr minette who is ailing who's just recovering his original um you know uh, life and desires and aspirations and uh, the kind of home that she has formed uh, with her father is what becomes a kind of a talisman for these men who kind of uh, are attracted to this um uh, sacred halo which uh, Lucy Minette has orchestrated. This is the illustration of Carton leaving Lucy's presence at Soho Square. Uh, this is by, done by Harry Furness uh, for the 1910 edition. Uh, we can see the dejected look in the way uh, Carton hangs his head uh, and uh, walks with a woebegone face. And we have Lucy Minette turning away from him. It's both symbolic as well as literally a picture of dejection and uh, um, uh, futility. There's a lot of futility at work here. Life is futile for uh, Sidney Carton and uh, Lucy Minette can do uh, nothing to help him out. So, Carton is trying to uh, get a promise out of Lucy Minette and it is not a very complicated promise that he seeks from uh, Lucy. He says that, will you let me believe when I recall this day that the last confidence of my life was reposed in your pure and innocent breast and that it lies there alone and will be shared by no one. So, uh, it is a very simple promise that he wants out of Lucy. He says that, do not tell what I have declared to you to anyone not even to the ones who are closest to you the uh, dearest to you and he implies Charles Darnay he doesn't want Darnay to know that he is much affected by um, Lucy so that's what he seeks out of uh, Lucy Minette and he says that when I recall this day, uh, I want to be aware that my confidence is uh, lying undisturbed in your heart. Nobody is going to dig that confidence out of your um, heart. So that's the promise that he wants. And this idea of uh, recalling uh, is uh, very interesting because we see that this is a theme that uh, crops up time and again in a tale of two cities. Um, let us see who are all uh, recalled. Uh, we have Dr. Minette who is literally recalled to life because he was buried uh, in uh, the Bastille for 18 years and then he was hidden away uh, with his uh, ex-servant Defarge in his wine shop garret. So, he is recalled to life by Mr. Lowry and then we have um, secrets being recalled. Uh, we have hidden mysteries that are going to be recalled that are half recalled and uh, it is in this kind of context we also need to um, fit uh, Carton's um, promise uh, that he wants out of Lucy that when he recalls this day at some point in the future he wants to be sure that this will not come to light. Uh, he wants to protect the sanctity of this particular secret. So, uh, secrets, hidden mysteries are some of the thematic associations that we have in this uh, conversation that Carton has with Lucy Minette. And he offers a promise, Carton offers a promise to Lucy, it is a very important promise because this is a promise that he does fulfill uh, at the end of the novel and um, let us see what that promise is. The time will come, the time uh, not 
be long in coming when new ties will be formed about you, ties that will bind you yet more tenderly and strongly to the home you so adorn, the dearest ties that will ever grace and gladden you. Oh, Miss Minette, when the little picture of a happy father's face looks up in yours, when you see your own bright beauty springing up anew at your feet, think now and then that there is a man who would give his life to keep a love beside you. This is a very important promise in the entire novel. This promise has a lot of um, power. In fact, you can uh, put this promise against the big uh, epochal radical uh, event of the French Revolution on the other side. So we are pitting a promise, an individual promise on the one side and the power of the revolution on the other. And this promise has the power to recover Lucy and her family from the clutches of the French Revolution. So um, this promise has a lot of ideological significations which I want you to unpack and unravel and make sense of it. But literally what he says here is that um, you're going to have new ties. Lucy Minette is going to marry. Uh, he knows that Lucy Minette will marry Charles Darnay and uh, this couple will have children. Um, you know, more ties will be uh, formed with Lucy Minette and Charles Darnay at the center of it. And he says that Th those ties will gladden you, will make you happy. Those ties, uh, those ties will grace this home. And um, he says that your husband, he doesn't say it directly, he implies that your husband will become a happy father. Um, we also have an unhappy father here. That, that reference is to Dr. Manette and he's unhappy because of his past. But then a new father, happy father will be born because of the children that um, Darnay will have with Lucy Manette. And uh, he also implies that your own beauty, Lucy's beauty will be reflected in the uh, faces of her children uh, playing at her feet and despite all this picture of happiness, he says that do remember that uh, uh, there is this man called Carton who will give up his own life to to kind of protect the life that Lucy uh, loves. So that's his promise. He says that there is a man, remember, who would give his life to protect, to safeguard um, the life that uh, you love, the life that you want to protect. And that is a promise. And I want you to connect this particular statement of Carton's with the earlier statement about uh, um, the crowd that's going to come to Lucy Manette's home and he says that I will take that crowd into my life. I will ask for no uh, obligations. I will ask for no promises. I will just take them into mine. And this is a kind of a Christ-like promise that Carton offers to Lucy. Now let's take sense of the courtship plots um, which have um, kind of originated with Lucy at its center. We have Mr. Striver's uh, courtship plot fizzling out. He sets out to uh, declare his intentions to Lucy but then he uh, takes a detour. He goes to Telson's and then he's warned by Mr. Laurie not to go unless he has some firm knowledge that he would be accepted and then Mr. Striver realizes that Mr. Laurie is correct that maybe Lucy will not accept him and therefore he decides not to make an offer of promise. So that pl uh, courtship plot first the courtship plot of Mr. Striver doesn't work out in the context of the romantic plot. And then we have Mr. Carton's um, plot fizzling out as well uh, because Mr. Carton uh, knows that it's not going to go anywhere. Mr. Carton knows that he will not um, uh, ultimately uh, have uh, Lucy Minette as his wife. So Mr. Carton almost self-deconstructs. He is a man who knows that he has uh, destroyed his life and he con continues to destroy his life in certain aspects and, and um, that serves both uh, you know, uh, narrative purpose as well as uh, ideological purposes. We, uh, the narrative finds it easy to have Mr. Carton who's, who doesn't have a domesticity. We will talk more about it uh, in the um, future sessions.
So at this point, we need to note that the courtship plot of both Mr. Carton and Mr. Striver failed and Darne is the one who will succeed uh, with Lucy Minette. This chapter is titled The Honest Tradesman and like the previous chapter, um, this uh, chapter's title is also very ironic because uh, the readers will come to know those who have uh, read the novel completely will know that there is nothing very honest about this tradesman that we are going to um, uh, get a good uh, picture of and um, by the end of the 15th chapter we will know that there is something shady going on uh, with regard to this particular honest tradesman. So, this chapter begins with uh, Jerry Cruncher and his son um, are waiting outside Telson's bank and they see a funeral procession of Roger Cly and uh, Mr. Cruncher is interested in this uh, crowd in this uh, funeral procession and then he goes and enquires uh, who uh, is the one who is dead and for whom there is a procession. And, um, everybody starts saying that he there are spies here he's a spy spy spies and then Mr. Cruncher asks was this man was this dead man a spy and uh, old Bailey spy returned his informant yaha yaha old Bailey spies and then dead as a mutton returned the other man in a crowd and uh, can't be too dead had them out their spies pull them out their spies. It's an interesting scene uh, because this is what we call a crowd scene. Crowd scenes in Dickens's fiction are very interesting because you do not know how the scene is going to turn out. Uh, this scene begins as a funeral procession with people um, crying that he is a spy, with the people uh, in the crowd hating the dead man and then um, suddenly they become so angered that they want to pull out the body from the coffin and uh, you know uh, make a riot uh, with it and, and um, they, they are very destructive. So, this crowd scene is uh, very interesting because as they are uh, trying to uh, get the coffin out, they chase out w the one mourner who is there as part of the procession. So, there is one mourner for Roger Cly and that is Roger Cly's friend and he runs away seeing the mood of the crowd which is very destructive, which is very reckless and he is worried for his safety. So, he just runs and then what happens strangely the crowd changes its mind and that is what is important uh, about the crowd scenes in Dickens because Dickens tries to tell the readers that the crowd can be easily swayed. There will be just one person in the crowd who will change the mood of the entire body of people and um, suddenly this crowd decides that they are going to uh, in fact take the you know hearse uh, to the churchyard and then um, bury the coffin with a lot of song and dance and that is what they do. The idea was so acceptable in the prevalent absence of any idea the crowd caught it up with eagerness and loudly repeating the suggestion to have them out to pull them out mobbed the two vehicles so closely that they came to a stop uh, and this is what happens uh, as I said the crowd decides to destroy the procession and they do attempt to attack the mourner who runs away fearing for his safety and then suddenly as I just said now they decide to continue with the funeral with the procession up to the uh, church with a lot of rejoicing. So, the mood changes pretty quickly. And that is very significant because um, Dickens is trying to strike a parallel with this crowd um, and uh, make us think about the future crowd that is going to erupt uh, on the other side of the channel which is in France. So, you can compare the crowd uh, in Britain which changes its mind very very quickly and the, the mood of the crowd the French revolutionary crowd that soon loses sight of its ideal and start to slaughter um, you know willy nilly um, the crowd does not care about the innocence all they want is vengeance and they thirst for blood. So, you can compare the you know the crowd scenes um, in Britain with the crowd scenes in uh, France. 
So, this is the crowd scene um, in which we see the uh, procession of Roger Clyde that is what is mentioned here the uh, spice funeral. You can see there is a lot of rejoicing we have uh, people with uh, drums you know there is a man playing uh, a drum there are people dancing about um, you know and there is this um, horse the, the horse drawn uh, uh, carriage which has the coffin inside and there is a lot of um, uh, you know uh, dance and it is almost carnivalesque. And this is um, another illustration of the same uh, crowd scene. We have the carriage, uh, the horses here, uh, a man with a drum uh, with a lot of boys uh, enjoying themselves, people screaming. We have one more, one boy trying to plug his e ears in order to, uh, you know, uh, block the noise out. So, again, a very uh, riotous scene. Now, the, the crowd takes the uh, you know uh, coffin to the churchyard and then they uh, finish their uh, ritual and they start to attack um, the uh, businesses in the neighborhood. They start to run riot and uh, they also start to impeach casual passerbys. They rough up um, you know people who are walking on the streets. So, um, people are maltreated, hustled and there is a general uh, recklessness. There is a kind of a violence to the way they proceed because they are uh, trying to wreck up all the um, shops and there is a lot of window breaking as well, plundering of public houses, public houses meaning uh, inns, places where people stay, have a drink and, and all these places are attacked and there is suddenly a reference to uh, a rumor that the guards are coming this way and the crowd just disperses. So, that is the way the mob proceeds in this particular uh, scene in uh, Britain. A rumor got about that the guards were coming. Before this rumor, the crowd gradually melted away and perhaps the guards came and perhaps they never came and this was the usual progress of a mob. So, a rumor is enough. A rumor is enough to make the uh, crowd behave in radical uh, ways and, and in radically different ways too. So, if you remember the scene, it begins uh, with a procession and then they decide to destroy the procession itself and the coffin and then they decide to take it back to the churchyard and then they attack the uh, neighborhood and then they disappear because there is a rumor that the guards are coming. So, the, it, the way it changes its mood is um, indicative of the group mentality of uh, the people involved in that uh, particular action and Dickens is always uh, suspicious of a mob mentality. And there is always a comparison of this kind of mob to the revolutionary crowd, which when you come to see them are also changing their minds quite swiftly. Now, Jerry Cruncher has been following this mob, this crowd um, uh, which is part of a funeral procession and on the way back uh, Jerry calls on his medical advisor, it is a very interesting phrase, he checks in on a doctor and then he uh, goes home and um, after his dinner. Um, Jerry asks his son to go to sleep and then he is preparing to go away somewhere and the son wants to know where and he says I am going as your mother knows a fishing that is where I am going, going fishing uh, and um, it is a very you know, mysterious phrase. Uh, we do not uh, really believe that Jerry Cruncher is going to go fishing, he is going to do something else, fishing becomes an euphemism for an activity that um, Jerry Cruncher does not want to talk about uh, with his son and um, Jerry Cruncher also knows that his wife knows the real nature of his job 
and young Jerry pretends to sleep, but then um, he follows his father. As Jerry Cruncher uh, leaves his house, he hides and then uh, starts to stalk his own father. What does he find? He finds that his father and three others are walking towards a churchyard and in that churchyard the three men try to unearth a coffin and that is what um, young Jerry finds um, about his father. Crouching down in a corner there and looking in he made out the three fishermen creeping through some rank grass and all the gravestones in the churchyard. It was a large churchyard that they were in looking on like ghosts in white while the church tower itself looked on like the ghost of a monstrous giant. They did not creep far before they stopped and stood upright and then they began to fish. So, this scene is seen through the eyes of the young boy, the young cruncher and this man we should uh, realize is following his uh, father and he finds his father and his friends um, getting into a churchyard and they are uh, trying to unearth a coffin which has been recently buried and it is very easy to guess that they are trying to unearth the recently buried Roger Cly, the spy that the crowd um, very riotously, uh, riotously uh, buried um, quite recently and it is a very interesting scene and atmospheric scene because um, look at the way the uh, tombstones are described, the tombstones look like ghosts in white and in fact the church tower itself looked like the ghost of a monstrous giant, a massive structure which is threatening. So, it is a very um, atmospheric seen and there are gothic elements with references to ghosts and giants. And then they began to fish and at this point uh, cruncher, the young cruncher realizes what is the literal meaning of fishing. They are fishing for uh, not fish but dead bodies. So, that is what his father is doing at night and that is why his father's hands are rusty and the mystery is resolved for uh, Jerry Cruncher. Thank you for watching. I will continue the next session.